Hey Outliers, welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, where every week I interview an entrepreneur or investor that's in the top 1% of their field, all to decode what they've mastered and tease out the habits, influences, and lessons that have propelled them to the top. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, we explore what it's like to build the investment platform of the future with Joe Prococo of Titan. Titan is one of the most fascinating fintech companies today and just closed a new round of financing, valuing them at $450 million. In this episode, we explore the lessons that Joe took away from his time at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, his frustrations with investing in the dual class system that exists in many asset classes, which led him to co-found Titan, Titan's current investment funds, their strategy, their investment process, and their upcoming crypto launch, and how Joe thinks about building Titan's operating system and why they approach hiring as if they're building a tribe. To learn more about Titan, go to titan.com or follow them on Twitter at TitanVest. You can also follow Outlier Academy on Twitter for exclusive clips, quotes, and more at Outlier Academy. And you can find the show notes with links to everything that we cover, as well as the full text transcript at outlieracademy.com. Let's jump into the episode. Joe, welcome to Outlier Academy. I'm so excited about this conversation. Thank you so much for making time. Thanks for having me, Daniel. I'm stoked to be here. So I wanted to start with just having you give a quick sketch of your background because you had some interesting experiences at Goldman Sachs and McKinsey. I want to ask a couple questions, but maybe just to start for anyone that's not familiar, just kind of fleshing out your path before Titan. I'm originally from a small town in New Jersey called Hillsboro. I don't know if you've ever driven through New Jersey, like 287 or I-95. It's one of those exits off of that. There's probably about like 30,000, 40,000 people in the town. Just to paint the color of that town, the hallmarks are probably the Kohl's and the bagel store. And you have to make like one of two really important decisions growing up, which is do you play t-ball or soccer? That's hometown. (laughs) When I went to Penn undergrad, I went to Wharton there's a high degree of culture shock. It was just sort of like, this isn't sort of the farmland that I knew I was growing up from. Penn was a ton of fun, learned a lot, met a lot of really awesome souls. It seems like there's a bit of an assembly line. You graduate right from Penn and just walk into 200 West Goldman Sachs. <laughs> so I followed the assembly line, went there, really had a special time. I worked for a little bit also for the current CEO at Goldman, his name David Solomon. He's awesome. But yeah, then I realized that wasn't the right position on the field for me. And I knew I wasn't destined to be an advisor, but I knew I was destined to roll up my sleeves and be on the playing field getting muddy. So I flew out to San Francisco and joined McKinsey in their tech practice. I worked with a bunch of really awesome clients there from PayPal to StubHub, you name it. And it was so fun, the projects we're working on. And then I knew I was closer to the position on the field that I should be, but not quite. And so ultimately I said, I need to go do these things myself. And in particular, investing was probably one of the most embarrassing problems I couldn't solve for myself. And that was sort of the origin behind Titan sort of began. I love that progression that you (laughs) you laid out of (laughs) from the beginning all the way to Titan is fascinating. I'm curious for if you could share, or if there's something that kind of resonates for you We've had people on the show that have certainly spent time at Goldman, spent time at McKinsey. And something I'm always fascinated by is both of those are iconic places to work. And it sounds like necessarily wasn't quite the right fit, but that you learned an incredible amount and those were still formative experiences. So I'm curious, is there one or two kind of a gem, a secret, an insight, just something that you still hold with you or think about from your time at Goldman and your time at McKinsey that you can share with people listening? That's a really great question, Daniel. Goldman reminded me, I know there's a work smarter, not harder. That seems to be the cool thing to say these days. There's a bit of a contrarian idea, which is like values work ethic, which is from another era that I wasn't born in. I don't know your age. You probably weren't born in it too. That it seems like a different era pre-World War II actually very much valued work ethic. And that was part of the cultural norm. I think what Goldman Sachs is exceptional at is crafting that sort of environment. Is that sort of what you've seen as well, or at least heard from other guests? Well, I mean, I haven't heard it articulated that way, but I think it's fascinating. And I mean, the way that that resonates for me is in my background, a big part of my background's 
in design and it sounds very similar to the culture at Apple where it's definitely a, you're working with really bright people. Everyone's trying to work smarter. They're not trying to just grind themselves into the ground. And yet it's absolutely a culture that the bar is very high for the amount of work that's expected. And it's almost, and I mean this in a really positive sense, it almost kind of harkens to me being in the military where there's just a, like, you need to roll up your sleeves and then do the work <laughs> kind of mentality. For sure. And one of the amazing things is it's almost like as if they've only taken the positive aspects of the military and embedded it partially into their culture. So all the analogies, like you feel like you're in the trenches with peers. There's a singular mission. We're going to roll up our sleeves and do whatever it takes for our clients at work on our behalf. I definitely learned that DNA from Goldman. And obviously, part of that, you grew up with it just being a big athlete growing up way back when that was already, I so I was biased to like those environments, to be very clear. But it was something that I feel like it might be being lost a little bit these days, which is the charm of working relentlessly hard for a mission. And just having pride in that. It's actually something to be prideful of. If you really love your work, you're really giving it your all. So that's Goldman. That's nice. I'm going to shift to McKinsey. I think one of the things when I reflect back on that experience is they might not articulate it this way, but architecting people to solve problems in a systems thinking way. I feel like coming out of McKinsey, one is able to take whatever issue or problem there is, take a whiteboard marker and draw it. And I forget that like, there's that like really famous book, which is it takes the top thousand words in the English dictionary and only uses those words to describe like an airplane or a microwave. I think it's called Thing Explainer. Yeah, Thing Explainer, I have that at home. Thing explainer. That's great. Bill Gates recommended that one. And I feel like (laughs) a core skill one needs to have is just being able to be master of a universe of something. If someone says, hey, Daniel, I'm thinking about starting a lemonade stand. Like, should I or should I not? Like, you quickly need to become master of the universe and be like, okay, these three things matter. Will my friend like it? Are they good at it? What are the alternatives? So in theory, you've just created like three different buckets, each with a system and From there, McKinsey was also really exceptional at helping me open my eyes to what it means to architect a team to go attack those said things. And so when you put those two and two together, team-focused work ethic, plus the ability just to understand how the universe works and drive people to attack it, it's like ultimately why I felt so prepared to go do Titan. I was like, I feel like I have the core backbones of what I need to know. That's fantastic. Thank you for both of those. Shifting over to Titan... You hinted at this earlier, and I think something I always love asking founders, entrepreneurs is if there was a founding secret or a founding insight that kind of made you like, we have to go and build this company. I feel like this is the drum roll part. Drum roll. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If I had an effects button, maybe we'd do a drum roll. I have a deep degree of humility before I comment on these sorts of things, because it seems like every book under the sun tries to claim like this is the universal truth. So I'm just going to say, from my experience... I like it. This stuff is so hard for a variety of reasons. I could not imagine working on a problem I personally did not feel exceptionally frustrated by. I literally just could not. You unlock your finger painting on the shower where the steam hits on product ideas. Like that's how much I'm obsessed with this problem. And I just know I'm just going to bring my best that much more. And so what the frustration was no one teaches you how to invest, like no one. You don't have a college teacher, rarely do you even have a mentor. Oftentimes, even one's parents are necessarily the most educated about investing. And that was the knowledge I had walking into arguably the best finance school in the country. And then here I am at Goldman Sachs doing finance things. And yet I can't even figure out how to move my own bank account. I had to literally go take the cash from Bank of America savings to investment account. This was before Robinhood and so forth. I don't know if you had a similar journey, but to me, investing was one of the most embarrassing problems I didn't solve until a friend did for me. I mean, it was a little bit different for me. I've just always been fascinated by it. But I think similarly, and that's why I was so excited about this conversation in part is I recognize, so I feel like I've been able to assemble my own map of the terrain and figure out what kind of makes sense or feels right for me in that space. But I think broadly speaking, that it's completely broken to your point that not only are we not equipped with just really basic education, 
so that the bar to just understanding these things at a conceptual level is really high. But then it's the other crazy. one is just the sophistication. I'm glad we're in a wave where those platforms like Robo Advisors, as an example, that are making things less intimidating. But I would say generally, it's still very intimidating. And it's a very in your own head, you feel negative about it. it doesn't make you feel good. Like you understand what you're doing. What's funny is the like drum roll, the secret insight. It wasn't necessarily even like what I just said, which was the frustration. It was the idea that there's two different menus. And you get where I grew up from. No clue. I could barely spell investing. But then seeing what high finance is like, in particular from an investing standpoint, I was privy to know most of the smartest peers coming out of Wharton who now are some of the best finance professionals in the country. That was my peer group at Penn. And I saw the jobs that they took working on behalf of institutions and investing their capital. Buzz terms include private equity, venture, hedge fund. In reality, going back to the systems thinking that we discussed earlier, the mental model here is very simple. There are human beings who have expertise to manage money, and they currently have vehicles designed to only do it for th things that can give you multi-billion dollar checks. And so I realized that Wall Street is just like one big restaurant. If you are an everyday American with sub 10 million of net worth, you're seated in the front, you're given a you menu. You get the kid's menu. You get the kid's menu. You get the shitty chicken tenders, <laughs> the French fries. You get the option for a mutual fund. And then once you're done, they shushi you at the restaurant. But like as soon as you cross the wealth divide, a waiter named Morgan Stanley taps you on the shoulder. They like kick off those chicken tenders off your table, say, yo, come with me through the back. You walk through the back. All of a sudden, you're in this new world, you get a new menu, and you got the chef waiting for you behind. And that's what frustrated me the most, was not necessarily me trying to figure out how to get into the restaurant. It was the fact that even once I figured out how to get in, everything you're discussing, robo-advisors, you name it, all these other different platforms, they're predominantly front of restaurant vehicles. And that was the like, all right, roll up your sleeves, Joe, you got a 30-year journey you're breaking down, you're merging both sides. Like I knew it instantly. That's fascinating. And it's a really interesting analogy to kind of think about that. I think building off of that, one thing I was curious about is how you think about how you fit into the broader market. And it feels like we've kind of started to, I don't know, shade that a little bit with you're trying to take sophisticated strategies that I think you're totally right. They should be available to everyone, but they aren't, or they haven't been historically. You're trying to make that for mainstream investors. I'm curious, there's also words like active and passive. Do you guys think of yourself as maybe similar to an active ETF? How do you think about that? I think about it like human use case. I never used to be a fan of history or biographies. I used to find it quite boring. Now I've like literally totally flipped because like what you realize is the world changes, but humans don't. And investing is one of the oldest human behaviors Actually, let me say, not one of the oldest. You could say like eating and breathing is probably one of the oldest human behaviors. But when you think about like passive, passive, the primary human use case is like make it go away. This investing thing is important for my financial health. I would like to make it go away. It's the newest and the smallest in terms of revenue human use case. So Jack Bogle at Vanguard, he invented the index back in the 60s. Before then, there was no real way to invest in an index. And then go a little bit further back in history. You have the Amsterdam Stock Exchange where you can trade the first stock, the Dutch East India Co. Robinhood is in theory a modern operating system for then a 400-year-old use case. And then the third and final use case is show me the way. I actually want instead of like a Robinhood or the second use case, which is get out of my way. I literally just want to do whatever I want. I want to profit from it. I just want to be a part of it. I want to gamble with it, whatever. The third use case is I want to give my money to someone to actually do this whole thing for me. That is called investment management. That use case is several thousand years old, started by the Phoenicians, where they would pay 20% of profits. They would take 20% of carry from ship owners for the goods coming off the ship. And the last great operating system built in this category is a little company called Fidelity, which right now manages $4 trillion dollars on this technology called mutual funds. And I think I just saw an eye roll from you because yes, a mutual <laughs> fund is a VHS tape. And so 
that's where we sit, which is just like, there's a ton of passive players and it exceptionally well. There's a bunch of really great folks in the second category. No one has yet to say who is the next Fidelity, who's the next t -Row, who's the next active management operating system. And that's what we're building. I love it. Getting into the specific strategies. In a second, we're going to come to something I know that you're working on shipping, which I'm really excited to chat about, which is a new crypto product. But before we get into that, I think just to stay in the kind of public equity, I don't know, the kind of typical investment universe, talk a little bit about the three strategies you have today. So flagship opportunities and offshore. And I know we can get super deep. So I'm just curious, kind of staying at a high level, what's the pitch for each of those? Are they kind of generally managed the same way? Daniel, here's a pitch to grow your money, to compound it at really high rates, you need to have exposure to certain different asset classes or certain different sectors of the world. One of the most important sectors you need to have exposure to is blue chip tech. These are monopoly players. Flagship does that. Another thing you have to have exposure to are the future stars. Let's call it these like the emerging bets on things that could be blue chip in the future. That's opportunities. We also should not be US centric for diversification reasons, but also having humility that some of these best companies in the world are now in India and China. That's offshore. And fourth, crypto, we believe, deserves a fundamental slice of your allocation. And so that's crypto. And you can sort of chart the vision from here, which is the goal is to be what Fidelity or so forth was. So we're just going to keep rolling out products to expand things we can invest you in, private asset classes, venture, real estate, you name it. But more so, we've got a number of different people like legacy mutual fund managers who manage one to $3 billion reaching out saying, hey, I want a mobile app too for my clients. Can I just launch a product on Titan? So in that last 30 seconds, you got the master plan. That's it. That'll probably take us 10 years to do. So we're in year three. Yeah, it's amazing. It's super interesting. One follow-up question on the offshore piece. I'm curious for your take. I mean, from my experience, so I've tried to really make an effort to read more, think more about China, India, and that part of the world. And I think part of that for me is finding new sources that are more local. Part of that is finding investors or people in those spaces that I think are really interesting. So I'm, I'm curious because my experience there has been that I think in the US, we really discount that. Maybe we're maybe more bullish on something like India, but because of some of the tension that we feel with a country like China, I think a lot of people either think it's, I've heard everything from it's a scam, you shouldn't invest in any Chinese company, which seems extremely silly, to people that just, I think, aren't open-minded to it. What would your pitch be of why that's not the case, why we all need to have an allocation to that part of the world and just be invested globally instead of just in the US? It's a really great question. It has deep roots which is the idea that you, Daniel, are like a citizen of the world. You take earnings that you get from your job here, and it's basically, okay, I need to deploy this productively. Which companies deserve my money so that way they can use it productively to continue pushing the world forward? And the world is comprised not just of the United States of America. Obviously, we're a really important place, but there are things in India that say, Daniel, Pick me, pick me. I actually need to go take everything you just did in e-commerce in the United States. And I'm going to go impact several billion people here in the Indian region to go do that. Or in China, ignore what my government's saying. Pick me. I'm just a company. I'm here to impact a billion people in China with helping them assess how they socially buy goods. And that's going to push the world forward. And then what that gives you, Daniel, is a sense of agency. You get to pick. So... Whereas a passive product just says, Daniel, screw it. Just give literally a little bit of money to everything. Have no discernment. What makes investing such a beautiful exercise is you actually do get to play judge and jury. And the companies are the ones coming to your court and they're pitching themselves on why they deserve your capital. And for us, we're just sort of a conduit. We're saying to you, hey, Daniel, there are companies in China, India, that are asking for your capital, we actually think they deserve a piece because they can push forward a part of the world further and you will capture a slice of that value, aka your wealth is going to grow. So that's like sort of like how I just think about the world with respect to investing. The conclusion here is like, you are a powerful person. Go and use that power and actually invest globally. You should invest globally, invest across asset classes, but like never forget that power that you that hold. That agency. You are a judge and you are a small judge, but a judge in the capital markets and you deserve 
to be that judge. It's fascinating. I love the way you laid that out. One thing I really was curious to talk about is, so one area of focus that it seems like you guys have over-indexed on in a great way is a really unique investor experience. So obviously you're rebuilding a modern version of Fidelity. You're going to continue to roll out more strategies. And I think some people would look at that. I want to ask a question around this in a second, but I think some people would look at that and think like, well, that's fine, but anybody can do that. And I'm sure you would say, no, that's not the case. (laughs) We could talk about that. But I'm curious on around investor experience. I mean, everything from investors on the platform getting video updates, getting push notifications about portfolio and research updates, literally a fundamentally new model there that seems amazing for modern investors. Talk about that and talk about why that's so important and what you're excited that you've done there. This goes back to like that whole like the world changes, humans don't. This is the part where the world can change. Historically, every investment product has been a black box. Even if you, Daniel, were a customer of one of the richest hedge funds in the world, in order to figure out what's going on with your money, you have to hopefully get a call with their team or wait for a 15 to 30 page PDF that comes once a quarter. But you have to go to the website and find and download. And- you have to go to the website. <laughs> it's usually written in over ambitious prose as all these people think they're Jane Austen and they like to have like a very cute quote to start. And it's like, okay, you do what you do. You're not a great writer. But with that aside, it's a pretty obvious that there's a new solution. The, the same technology that empowers LeBron James to tell a million people that it's Taco Tuesday at his house, you can actually go give to an investment manager and say, go explain what you're doing to all of your clients In real time. Once. In real time. And what we call this internally is Project Cockpit OS. Historically, the cockpit was closed. You go stay and coach give us your money and they'll work on it. They'll figure out where they're driving you and then ultimately just get off the plane and you're there. With mobile technology and let's call it Taco Tuesday tech, you can actually have courtside seats to your own capital. Push button, Phil Jackson walks over and says, hey Daniel, here's exactly what's going on in China. Here's why we're investing you in India. And the cool thing behind this tech is not that it just unlocks a whole experience. It makes investors more confident to stay invested when the plane has turbulence. The biggest thing people confuse is turbulence for the plane itself going down. It's ridiculously harmful. And with push button, Phil Jackson comes over. Not only do you feel fine during turbulence, you may actually say, yo, Phil, can I put in more money during turbulence? This is like the best time to buy. And so This goes back to that operating system piece. Like we're not just here to do our own products. Eventually the goal is to say, all right, let's go empower all the other Phil Jacksons in the world that aren't Titan employees to be able to have this relationship with their clients. Super fascinating. And I love that you have so many good analogies here. (laughs) Master at, at these analogies, but I love that concept of, yeah, people confusing turbulence with the plane going down. That's especially true in crypto, which we'll talk about in a second. But I'm curious, we talked about That's the goal. Obviously, one of the biggest things that unlocks is that ability for people to continue to, I guess, build and maintain a really high level of conviction. This is the right thing. I know what's going on. We're making smart decisions. How have you seen that play out? Like, What feedback have you gotten from customers on the platform? Or how have you seen that positively shape people's behavior? There's been four periods of time where Titan has looked really stupid, i.e. market and Titan are both way down just because of volatility. It's totally natural. But like outside in, Historically, one would be like, why is this chart thing down 20%? And just like, okay, like what happens when push button Phil Jackson walks over and it's a period of turbulence? We've maintained 98 to 99% user retention during those periods and we've grown assets every time. And I don't say that on behalf of Titan, I say that on behalf of excitement for the world. The 25 year old version of myself, if that happens to me, I'm taking out all of my money and putting it to cash. Well, there goes 10% annual returns on like whatever small wealth I had at the time. And so now I'm just like on a mission, given the whole idea of making a black box an open box, what it just can do for one's own mental sanity. A byproduct of our mission is we're going to probably make the smartest generation of investors ever because now all of a sudden you have very smart people commenting on the world to you. So it's just like so important for a variety of reasons to really nail this. I wanted to ask, and maybe it will be a little bit of a mirror of the answer to this question, but I wanted to ask about how you think about your differentiation in your moat. And we've talked a lot about the differentiation piece, and maybe that 
boxes checked. But one thing I'm always interested to ask founders, entrepreneurs is what you think the most difficult to copy aspect of your model is. Meaning you obviously in business, you're competing against a bunch of other sophisticated players. A lot of people are going to try to clone and copy what's out there. What might people look at Titan and say, I'm going to do that. And they're just totally going to fail at, <laughs> at being able to ship that. Let's call it like two people, or there's a few different entities that may try to come after us. There's the Stanford, Penn, or Harvard dorm room student. There's you 10 to, years ago. <laughs> 10 years ago to code it. Then there's like new incumbent upstarts, and then there's like legacy players. So for the dorm room student, the unfortunate reality of consumer fintech, which is why there needs to be more entrepreneurs working on the problem, is it's really difficult to just start regulation, legal barriers, just the technology needed to be able to accept a large variety of accounts, non-trivial. We're still at the point in time where no one solved it. In terms of the incumbents and let's say the fidelities, like ultimately when you think what we're building is we're building the operating system between demand and supply. Demand are the Daniels in the world. I have money. I want to invest it. Supply, all these investment managers and investment products that could use said capital to be judge and jury. And we're building the layer in between. And so what you have from that is a business that has network effects, it has marketplace dynamics. And what it rests on in particular is the fact we're building a consumer technology company, i.e. the cockpit OS, the Phil Jackson push button experience inside an asset management category. And so it's sort of like you're merging two difficult disciplines into one singular network effects-based business. And so it's why this should be a winner-take-most dynamic and why we're excited to scale. But we're very, very humble about competition, in particular because we know our place in history. We are here to carry the torch and grab it from some of the old players who've historically have had it. That's a great answer. And we'll get into crypto in just a second, but I'm curious kind of building off of, it feels like a thread through our conversation is, I know earlier on you felt that frustration with wanting to invest in a sophisticated way and an intelligent way, being really frustrated at your options. I'm assuming that means you're just inclined to study investors, whether it's people like Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger or other investment figures. I'm curious for your take, like who, just as you look out at the field, I guess, who do you think is interesting? Who do you guys kind of pay attention to? Who do you feel like you've learned from? So it's much more about you and less about Titan, but I'm just curious for your take there. You should see one of our Slack channels internally, which is the whole investment management team, i.e. all the investment analysts who are in charge of making investment decisions across products. We have a Slack channel. We have several Slack channels per product. But one of the fun things that occur in these Slack channels are people just highlighting reading material and just highlighting different people that they're really spotlighting. This gives me FOMO. Like, I want to be in that Slack channel now. <laughs> I know. Honestly, one of our engineers proposed the feature of, can we just expose the Titan Investment Management channel as it's sort of like a premium Twitter? Like, wow. It's a cool idea. There is thing going on in the world. Titan Investment Management has a point of view on it that's actually really smart. So from an investing standpoint, obviously Buffett and Buffett is a boring answer, but one that continues to be revered for the reason that he nailed sort of the core universal principles before others had. And those universal principles are like diversification is only required if you don't know what you're doing. Like smart concentration is actually important. He was one of the ones who thought through the idea of compounding, what 15% annualized returns can really do. The fact that there's a big difference between stock price and business fundamentals. This is just like, check, 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 check. Nothing's really changed. The issue that he had, and it was nice to see him evolve, was the whole industry had a big bias towards price. So i.e. value. If you have a stock that you're looking at, Daniel, you do really great research. You'll be like, wow, this is a really high quality business. But the price of the company being sold to me as judge is too high. I'm going to pass. What the industry started to pivot to, arguably, maybe not fast enough, is that even if you're going to pay a high price today, it could be well worth it because of how fast these companies are growing, i.e. tech. And it took a bit of time for Buffett to get a memo. So now a lot of some of the people we really take inspiration from include Philippe Lafont at Kotu, who's one of our investors in Titan. He runs both public equity 
and a growth business and tech. Very and well respected. models apply. Super well respected. But yeah, there's a long list of people that we just follow and track on the investment management team. What are they saying? Why are they saying it? We just have really interesting mental models. It's fascinating. Well, if you ever open that up, I want to be first in line to get access to that Done. Slack channel. We'll give you beta Great. access. Okay. So I want to focus and talk about crypto. And I think to start, I would say generally people in our age group tend to be open-minded about crypto. But I think that the opinions kind of individual by individual really fall across a really big spectrum. I still know people that I think are really smart that think it's a bubble. I personally don't. Just to start, I'd be curious for your take, Titan's take on just why you kind of mentioned that idea earlier. Why should everybody have an allocation to crypto? And what's the kind of role that you see that playing? There was often a binary debate that was occurring in society, which is whether crypto, so A, not even on like a protocol basis, just like crypto assets, is the asset class a zero? And it's a bit of the wrong debate to be having. The smarter debate is, that Voltaire quote, judge a person by their questions, not their answers. The right question to ask here is, are there crypto assets that deserve a weighting in your portfolio? And so notice like the precision of the question can include a 1% weight, a bet. And so for us, there are crypto assets that very, very much deserve a portion of one's portfolio. But the big debate from economic theory standpoint is just what percent of your portfolio does it deserve? It seems like the world is converging anywhere between 1% to 10% is sort of like the 25th to 70th percentile. And then from there, it's like, okay, do you just buy Bitcoin, which is sort of the gold standard, or are there other protocols that also should make the cut? And so for us, we see crypto and a lot of the technologies there as long-term viable Obviously, there's still many of them that need proof of concept. You need to take a look at the technologies, take a look at the team. But it's pretty clear that there could be a version of the world where crypto is very present. And then as a good capital allocator, going back to that judge and jury argument, it's just how much of your 100 poker chips do you allocate towards the possibility of crypto really being a thing here to stay? And so for us, it's like largely a summation of the mental model that we think about it. I think it's fascinating. And I think I love the reframing of that question because, again, it also gives that agency to every investor to decide for themselves. Because I think that's the thing there, too, is you're totally right. In the investing world, everything seems to be framed as, is it yes or is it no? Is it overvalued? Is it undervalued? Is it worth something? Is it worth nothing? It's very binary. And really, at the end of the day, it's much more of an individual conviction decision. And I think it should vary individual to individual. So I'm curious... Then can you talk a little bit about what sorts of strategies you're looking at? Because I think there's everything from, you kind of hinted at it, just focusing on the blue chips, but there's also really interesting stuff happening in the DeFi space. There's really interesting new crypto protocols that are always launching, evolving, growing. So how are you guys thinking about the asset class and how to kind of make that something that investors can access? In terms of your precise question, like how can investors access it? We all know you can go buy crypto assets on different platforms. What it seems like the primary problem to be solved is a lot of people are chit-chatting about crypto, whether at a dinner table or what have you, but no one yet has a firm answer on, okay, like, what should I do? How much should I put? Where should I put my assets? Our approach, and it's fun to take someone as old school as Buffett and apply those same principles to a new age asset class like crypto, but the same principles apply. Like one should not deviate from these universal theorems, even though it's an exceptionally new and different thing. In reality, there still is a lot of fundamental research to be done on a per protocol basis with the overall outcome being that you have a concentrated basket of crypto assets, i.e. you've bet on a sub component of the horses in the race that could then give you outside returns. And the big caveat to what I'm saying, you could make a strong argument, which is like, look, buy the whole race, invest in every horse in the Kentucky Derby, and you're designed to win because whoever wins will just go so up and far to the right. We think it's possible to do better just because crypto is not as efficient as the stock market. So with the ability, and here's a preview for our four-step process. So with the ability to screen qualitatively and quantitatively, 
and then apply a fundamental layer where you can actually read the white paper, get to know the engineering teams, get to know the applications, get a sense for traction and actually assess price. You can actually determine which are the better horses in the race to bet on. And so you can actually hopefully do better than just a Bitcoin weighted index. And so you'll see when we launch crypto in a few weeks that it's not just 95% Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm excited to see it. Can you give everyone, so it sounds like the launch is in a couple of weeks. Is there a specific date? And then can you just share for people that are listening and interested, where can they go to find out more about the crypto product? We're launching the world's first actively managed crypto product for retail investors in, I think, roughly three weeks, mid-July or so. We've just brought on a crypto investment analyst who's right now literally spending all of his day job doing exactly what I just described, who already did it before. We're formulating and putting the final dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the exact portfolio. And we're stoked to launch this in the coming weeks. It's really exciting. I have so many people reaching out to me, friends, family, just saying, what should I do with this whole crypto thing? And I'm stoked to just say, like, literally go download the Titan app. Well, it's a very different answer. I think you're totally right, because there's not many products like this. Outside of there's like Bitwise, which has stuff that's similar, but again, to your whole amazing metaphor earlier of two menus, it still is very much like two menus. You have to be a qualified purchaser in order to get access to that. It's a liquid. And I guess that's one other question I'd be curious is, what has been the hardest part of being able to ship this crypto product? Because it seems like uniquely difficult. <laughs> it is. Our engineering team is stellar. We weren't going to do anything crypto related until later this year, early next. I think we determined in late April, we were going to launch the first actively managed crypto product. And our engineering team is about to ship it in mid-July. Like this is just incredible. I know, just like rock star speed internally in the org. But most important for this exercise was ensuring one of my biggest pet peeves is a lot of consumer fintech just launches products. And I'm not going to say names, but putting confetti around options trading, there's no such thing on a balance sheet called intangible debt which is debt you're building that you're eventually going to have to pay. There are certain folks out there who have a massive amount of intangible debt because ultimately these consumers are going to get really smart and they're going to say, why the fuck were you marketing me these sorts of things when I had no clue what was going on and it wasn't the way to build wealth. And so for us, what we thought really, really hard about was like, look, crypto is a volatile asset class. In particular, if you put yourselves in the shoes of a client, we have the biggest risk of turbulence being confused for the plane going down. And we deeply care. Like our mission is to improve the compound growth rate of our generation. It's not to democratize tools. Like we have an outcome focused mission. Daniel should make more money in his bank account by being a Titan client than he otherwise would have been elsewhere in the world. Crypto, even if we launched a perfect product, If we didn't nail the UX and the customer experience, we would risk Daniel trading this product when it's down. And so again, to our mission, we need to crush it. We need to put ourselves in Daniel's shoes and say, what will he experience? He's possibly a first time crypto investor. All these things will have weird names. He will come into the mix, like having all these different points of view on Litecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin. So we need a way for him just to be like, wow, I got it. I'm invested in crypto. I feel amazing about it. It's the right allocation for me. If I have any questions, there's a very seamless way. This took a lot of iteration and user research. So without it, we could have probably launched like last month. It's the fact we're like empathy to the moon is what sort of is keeping us through mid-July. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And I also, just to say it, I feel like a product like this that incorporates that cockpit OS or that experience of real-time updates, this, especially a crypto asset class where, I mean, even if you just look at the, go pull up the Bitcoin chart or any kind of coin chart over the last two months, it's incredibly volatile and it's had huge price swings. So it feels like that investor experience and how much you've overweighted that will play a huge role here in making this successful. Do you own any crypto assets? I do. And I've invested since 2015. And so I've experienced a lot of the turbulence. But I'm a big believer in the long term. But I think my approach there is very different from others. And it sounds more aligned with yours, which is I'm not going to try to pretend that I know what this is going to be valued at or whether it's going to zero or whether it's going to be immensely valuable. I'm just going to make the bet that this is something interesting. I think this does have durable value. And so I'm going to invest in the asset class. And I'm a believer in that model. So I want to shift now to something I was curious is, I know from my experience as an investor, as founder, entrepreneur, you kind of have these unlocks or these 
sometimes they're aha moments. Sometimes there's just, you really notice a change in a perspective or a belief that you had over time. So I'm curious, I wanted to ask you if you've had any kind of aha or big unlocks on the investing side and on the kind of business founder entrepreneur side that you can share with guests. Super open-ended, pick anything there. The number one unlock. Ask me again in five years. Maybe I change my answer. (laughs) Right now, I think the biggest unlock is realizing that, and we say this internally, which is that the second most important product you ship is how everyone works together. And I could respond to your question saying the biggest unlock is the realization that most people underweight working on the company OS. And if you think about a company at a molecular level, like the biology of a company, what is the atom? And is this a high performing atom or is this a mediocre atom? For instance, if you're a consumer product company, it could be like the interplay between an engineer, a UX designer and a product manager. And how are they iterating, moving fast to just delight customers? And how are they coming together? Who have you hired in those seats? How are they architected amongst the other atoms? How does this form a molecule? And over the last 18 months, I really obsessed over the subject. How does Titan perform at an atomic level? And then how do you add up those atoms to a singular tribe that performs really well? And the reason why I said this is because I ask a lot of other entrepreneurs this question a lot. And it's the equivalent of saying like to massively change the tone of the response. It's the equivalent of going up to someone and saying, what do you do 10 p.m. in the gym? Like, are you shooting free throws? Like, are you stretching? Do you do yoga? And a lot of times people just give me shoulder shrugs. We don't really practice free throws at 10 p.m. in the gym as a company. And so I think it's really, really important. And I've just watched it unlock us to just crazy new highs internally. And it's just something we're going to continue to compound on ourselves. So take the same principles from investing, i.e. compounding, but apply it to one's business. And I think that's probably the biggest unlock. At a meta level, I think that totally makes sense. And I think this idea of you want to really spend time on how you work together, how the company structured values, all of that really makes sense. And I agree that it's something that feels underweighted typically. Are there any tactics or things you can point to For someone listening who's a founder who's like, yes, what's something that they can maybe, I don't know, we can plant in their brains that they can be thinking about or think about employing at their company that's been effective for you? One of the most important is interviewing. How do you assess? There's this article on the internet that just went viral, which I think was actually spot on. It's sort of like, what is this human here? And it's on the importance of just trying to figure out in a very, very limited amount of time, who is this human being? And should they be in your tribe with respect to your company? I was chatting yesterday with Eric, who is the CEO at Open Door, about this subject. And he was sharing the same sort of attitude, which is like the skill of being able to assess who's a killer, who's going to run through walls is really, really hard because interviewing is usually a human to human talk through it. And so it biases towards people who are articulate and exceptionally communicative and gregarious succeeding. It doesn't necessarily solve for, for better or for worse. Who is just going to carry the team on their back and like stay relentlessly positive? You have to do references, like blah, blah, blah. That's like one really, really important tactic in, is in final round interviews, having a cultural focused session where it's not fluff or bullshit culture stuff. It's sort of like the bar for the tribal culture. Is it met? And if that person has a thumbs down, this person should not be in, even if they crush the role, even blah, 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 stuff like that. I've realized like this sort of tactics, there's no playbook about the subject. There's no playbook, but I love the frame that you used of who deserves a place in this tribe. We have values, we have standards, who deserves a spot within those, I think is fascinating. Yeah. It's something I continue to reappreciate, which is just like human beings are the most important asset we have and architecting an org where they can do their best work and you've already brought on the best people, it's probably my number one task for the next decade. Like it just won't stop. This has been a fascinating conversation. For anyone that's listening that wants to follow you, wants to learn more about Titan, where can people find you online? Go to titanvest.com. And Titan Vest, not invest. Yeah, we've recently just got titan.com. That was a fun deal to go get, but that's not live yet. As of two months from now, go to titan.com. Once the deal closes, there we go. Exactly. But for now, it's titanvest.com. And do you have a personal Twitter account? 
anywhere people can follow you? I do. Yeah. Jay Prococo on Twitter. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. We're going to move on to the second part of this interview in just a second. So for anyone interested, move on to the second part of this episode. For links to everything we discussed, as well as our notes and takeaways from the episode, visit outlieracademy.com slash 38. You can also go behind the scenes and learn more about the habits, influences, and life lessons that have shaped Joe in the short bonus episode that follows this one. To dive deeper, visit outlieracademy.com, where you can find more conversations with incredible guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, Erling Kagi, Paula Ferris, and Mark Sisson. You can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Outlier Debrief, where every week on Friday, we share a few highlights from the latest episode with a few of our favorite books, quotes, articles, headlines, and moments from that week. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.